War II shaped a lot of my thinking. I was with an outfit that fought in the very early battles of World War II against the Germans. We were in the first serious ground battles against the Germans in North Africa. Uh, we were not, we, we thought we were well trained uh, at the time. We were well trained, but not for the war we were going to fight. Nor were we equipped for the war we were going to fight. I spent the rest of my time in the armed forces making sure that the outfit I was with was going to be trained for the war it was going to fight in the next war, not the last war. Uh, and that's why it was a great pleasure to be part of, of Reagan's uh, monumental efforts to improve uh, the armed forces and make them ready for the next war. Reagan was fundamentally a man of peace. I've seen many false depictions of Reagan as though he were a hawk and a man of war and so on and so forth. That was not the case. Reagan's whole idea was, was peace, to bring peace not only for the United States but for the, for the world at large, to make the, world, the, the whole world a safer place. Uh, but he believed, as did uh, our first president, George Washington, that, uh, that the surest way to maintain the peace is to uh, make it clear that you're always ready for war. Uh, and that was very, very much a part of, of who he was and, and, uh, and what the nation did at that time. I did not believe I was even being considered for the job. In fact, it was the farthest thing from my mind, to tell you the truth. Uh, I was, uh, I was a, about to turn 60 years of age when, uh, when he came to, to office, and, uh, and I had put in my retirement papers and expected to retire. So I went through my little drill with the president, told him uh, the, that I, my retirement papers were in, and I promised my wife We'd retire and we were building a new house and so forth. And it would, I told him I was honored to be even considered for the job. And I told him that I can think of half a dozen people that I know that are certainly as well qualified as I. And the president said, well, he said, I understand it all out. He said, Nancy and I still have this house out in California. And I thought, well, it's a little different, Mr. President. <laughs> but anyway, he said, you go talk to your wife and come back and, and tell me what you decide. Then he stuck his finger in my chest and said, but he said, I've looked at all the other candidates. And he said, I really want you to take this job. But he said, you talk to your wife and, and uh, decide. When you're a military officer and the President of the United States says, I want you to do something, it's, it's fairly difficult to say no. We were in the Cold War and facing the Soviet Union and, and the prospect of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union was certainly, uh, whether you, whatever probability you assigned to that, it was the most dangerous thing we faced. The great push for advice was on, on the nuclear business and how to uh, uh, tamp down the dangers of a nuclear war uh, with the Soviet Union. And there were a long list of things, of course, in that. And, and the, the basic thing was to uh, make sure that our own nuclear deterrent was uh, apparently absolutely top-notch to the Soviet Union. Beirut was a disaster for the United States. That is, the loss of the Marines there was a disaster. I felt that putting American forces between Israel and, uh, and its enemies was a mistake. I wrote a memorandum to the president recommending that we not do this. That was the only major disagreement that the president and I had during the time that I was that I was chairman and I you know it 
it has hurt me ever since that, that we didn't, that I, as the chairman, didn't work harder to convince him to get, to let us get out of there or to do something different from what we were doing. He was a, a nice man to be around. You know, I have a wonderful set of pictures that, of, uh, of Reagan laughing at uh, things. There's a great picture of, I don't know what, why uh, Mr. Weinberger and I were convoked, but we were called over to the White House and for something that was really important, but the two of us went together and we went into the office and uh, Reagan had just uh, been shown an old Life magazine with a picture of him, and I've forgotten what the picture was, but there's a great picture of him showing us this picture and all of us laughing. It typifies the relationship that he was able to, to carry on with people. You didn't want to disappoint him. You wanted to produce the best possible work that you could working for the man. I have a little job, he said, that I think will take you probably about six months. <laughs> six years later, I told Bill Clinton that I'd finally completed everything that, that, that President Reagan had asked me to do and wanted to be relieved. <laughs> we improved every facet of the armed forces of the United States. There wasn't any, there wasn't any phoniness in the improvement of the American defense establishment. Uh, the, the nuclear deterrent force, we improved everything from the warning system uh, to the communication system to, uh, the, to the training of uh, everyone involved in the force. Whatever it was, we improved every single facet of the armed forces of the United States. And if you don't think we did that, look again at the first Gulf War. You know, you may disagree with the, with the strategic concept or, or the end of it, how the, the, the Bush administration ended it or whatever, but if you look at what the armed forces did, uh, you will see the armed forces that Reagan built uh, and what they were capable of doing. And it was an astounding uh, operational success. The night we returned to Minnesota, when I retired several years later, uh, and the next morning my wife said, do you realize that's the first night that you haven't had a telephone call between midnight and uh, six o'clock in the morning in about the last 10 years? <laughs> so, so there are all sorts of things that, that actually keep you up at night. As you might expect, General Vesey had a remarkable career. After knowing him for many years, one begins to understand the essence of the man, the soldier, the husband, and the personal faith that chartered and guided his life and his decisions. He was gentle, kind, selfless, and a considerate man of conviction. A devoted person who was willing to sacrifice, share, and contribute to the to improve and service our nation, our military and soldiers he loved until the day he passed.